Welcome back. This morning we're going to start a series on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper over the next couple of weeks, starting last week and then into the next three weeks during our worship services. We're focused on the part of the catechism dealing with the Lord's Supper too. And it doesn't, I mentioned last week after church that we don't have many opportunities in our worship service to really focus on studying the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. So over the next few weeks in Bible class, we're going to be going along the same ways. We're going, to, we're going to broaden it a little bit more than what we're doing in the worship service. This morning, we're going to start by simply just taking a look at what the Bible has to say about the Lord's Supper. And then over the next few weeks, we're going to take a look at a lot of the errors that have crept into the Christian church regarding the Lord's Supper. We're going to talk a little bit about the history of the Lord's Supper and how it has been uh, practiced over the years and the centuries in the Christian church and take a look at some of those things. But today is going to be the foundation, looking at the Bible passages having to do with the Lord's Supper. And it really falls, there, there are really five main Bible passages that we're going to be taking a look at this morning. Three of those from the Gospel and then two from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. Those are the faint, five main sections dealing with the Lord's Supper. Before we go into that, I would like to begin with prayer. I'm going to use a hymn from the hymnal. We have in our, in our hymnal a rich heritage of hymns that we many times use as prayers. Many times they're, they're teaching devices. They help us to understand what the Lord's Supper is all about. And the prayer that I'm going to open up with this morning is from hymn 307. It's the oldest of all of the hymns in the hymnal, dating back almost 1,500 years it was originally written in a foreign language, in Latin, but it really reminds us of some of those basics of, the, of the, what the church has always understood about the doctrine of the Lord's Supper in just these three short verses from hymn 307. So we begin this, yes? Is that 307? 307, correct, yep. So we're going to begin with that as our prayer this morning. Draw nigh and take the body of the Lord. And drink the holy blood for you outpoured. Offered was he for greatest and for least, himself the victim and himself the priest. He that his saints in this world rules and shields to all believers life eternal yields. With heavenly bread makes them that hunger whole, gives living waters to the thirsting soul. Approach ye then with faithful hearts sincere, and take the pledges of salvation here. O judge of all, our only Savior thou, in this thy feast of love be with us now. Amen. So you will need the sheet that I distributed as well. well. You don't need it, but it will be helpful if you have it. And then also a Bible, if you have that along with you. We're going to start, I think any discussion of the Lord's Supper should probably begin with a little bit of a review of the term sacrament. A sacrament is something that we, as you take a look at the Christian church, define differently. For example, the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments. Uh, you take a look at the Eastern Orthodox Church and the practice of the Lord's Supper and the, the view of it is different. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, they also have seven sacraments. And that's because the definition that they begin with is different. And it's kind of important, if you have the Jehovah's Witnesses stop by at your house, one of the things that they will start with is they will try to get you to believe that the doctrine of the Trinity isn't taught in the Bible. And they have a little bit of a trick that they will use. They'll say, you know, you'll go to their house and you'll say, well, no, you know, I have a church that I belong to and I go to. And they'll bring up the word Trinity or triune. And they'll say, well, you know, that's not in the Bible. And you'll say, oh, yes, it is. I, it's all over in the Bible. And they'll say, no, it's not. You know, go ahead and get your Bible out and see if you can find the word Trinity or triune. And you'll go to the back of your Bible and you'll look in the concordance and you won't find the word Trinity. You won't find the word triune. It's a Latin word that the church used to describe the doctrine of who God is, but it isn't found anywhere in the Bible. And the same thing is true with the word sacrament. The word sacrament comes from the Latin, but it isn't found anywhere in the Bible. It's, it's a human term that we have used in the church in order to describe these two doctrines, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and what they do for us. <clears throat> 
So we're going to start with Luther's definition of a sacrament. This is what we use in the catechism. And uh, once we do that, we'll talk a little bit about some of the, the three main parts of the definition of a sacrament. So, so can somebody read that for us on the top of the, the sheet, Luther's definition of a sacrament? Dory? Dr. Martin Luther, a, sacri a sacred act ordained by God, wherein he, through certain external means connected with his word, offers, conveys, and seals unto men the grace which Christ has merited. So if we break down Luther's definition of a sacrament, it has three main parts. Some people might say four, but I usually take the, the first phrase there, a sacred act out. That, that's a basic, a very broad definition of the word sacrament, a sacred act, something that is holy, that's dealing with holy things. And so some churches, again, are you going to use that broader definition? But we more narrowly define it. What are the three things that are an essential part of our definition for a sacrament? What's the first one? Okay, so it, uh, we use it, in this translation, we have the word ordained, but I like your word there, Roline, instituted. I sometimes make it a little bit more specific and say instituted by Christ. So not even God. Uh, going back to you know, the Old Testament, we have marriage, for example, which was instituted or ordained by God. The Roman Catholic Church would say, well, that's one of the seven sacraments. But ordained or instituted by God. In other words... A sacrament has to be something that God says, do this, and this is how you do it. That's a pretty important part of our definition of a sacrament. What's the second part? Okay, we have to have an earthly element. That's an important definition, too, because some of the sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church do not have an earthly element. Uh, we like to further describe that second part. It's not just an earthly element. That earthly element has to be... It has another part. What's the second part to that? An earthly element that is connected to God's word. So I have my water bottle up here, and this is certainly an earthly element. Just because I have something to do with my water bottle doesn't make it a sacrament. That would make a whole lot of things sacraments if God ordained it and it has something to do with things on earth. But it has to be an earthly element that is directly connected to God's word. So that's part two. What's the third part? And this is the most important part of our definition of a sacrament. Means of grace. Okay, that it is a means of grace. And by that, what do we mean? What does it do? That's the question. Yeah, it offers, God imparts his blessings to us through it. And namely, the, the key one that we focus on is the forgiveness of sins. So we have those three parts. It has to be ordained by God, instituted by Christ. It has to have an earthly element. That earthly element has to be connected with God's word. And that earthly element then also has to be a means of grace by which God imparts his grace to us, namely the forgiveness of sins. So if you think about the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, and I don't know how familiar you are with the seven sacraments in the Roman Catholic Church, but what I like to do with my catechism students is I like to make a chart we build a we build a, a box. That's not going to work. We build a box, and in that box we put our three qualifications. So number one is, what's our first qualification for something to be a sacrament? Instituted by, Instituted by Christ. So we have that there at the top. Second one is. Earthly element connected with God's word. And the third one, forgiveness. forgiveness of sins. And then what we do is we put the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the next few rows. And we study each one of those sacraments or supposed sacraments. And we put check marks in where they meet these standards. Is it something that's instituted by God? So, for example, you get to marriage and you'd say, yes, it's ordained by God. We have it in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. So that checks that box. But then you get to earthly element connected with God's word and you say, hmm, well, there's an earthly element. You might say the wedding ring is an earthly element, but the wedding ring isn't specifically and directly connected with God's word. And then you get to the third box, offers forgiveness of sins. And you say, well, no, married people aren't any more forgiven than non-married people. So it, it doesn't meet that criteria. And we do that for each one of the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church. Now, some of the 
sacraments of the Roman Catholic Church, interestingly, don't check any one of those boxes. For example, confirmation. And by confirmation, we don't mean the classes, but rather the rite that takes place at the front of the church when a young person, generally, confesses their belief that is shared with the congregation and say, I'm going to promise to not deny that faith, but to continue on in that faith. Well, that's not instituted by God. It doesn't have an earthly element, and it doesn't offer forgiveness of sins. So, when you're talking to other Christians of different religious groups, you don't want to argue start off the, at the very bat, at the, the very beginning with, well, I have a correct definition of sacrament, you don't. Because it's an earthly definition. But what you can do is if you have these three parts of the sacrament, of what a sacrament is in the back of your mind, what you can do is you can say, well, you know, marriage is a great thing, but it doesn't offer forgiveness of sins. And so the one thing that most people of other churches will recognize is there is a difference in marriage or confirmation and baptism in the Lord's Supper because they do offer forgiveness of sins. Ordination doesn't. Extreme unction or last rites doesn't. So they have to admit, even if they still want to call it a sacrament, that baptism and the Lord's Supper are different than those other five sacraments, or at least four and a half of them. Luther once said, we have two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. And depending on your definition, he said you can throw penance in as a sacrament also because we have Bible passages that say, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Luther said, if you're going to use that basic definition, the most important thing, offering forgiveness, you could say that penance could be understood as a sacrament, even though it doesn't have an earthly element connected with God's word. It is certainly instituted or ordained by God, and it certainly offers a spiritual blessing. So Lutherans have usually understood that we have two and a half sacraments, uh, baptism and the Lord's Supper, and then penance if practiced correctly. So any thoughts to begin with on the definition of a sacrament? Just a little bit of foundation for where we're going to be going when we start to talk a little bit about the Lord's Supper. Okay, so we have five passages that we're going to look at this morning. And as we look at these five passages, what I would like you to do is I'd like you to think a little bit about, as we read these sections, what is God telling us? We're not going to make up doctrines. What we're going to do is we're going to read these passages and we're going to ask ourselves, what does God tell us about this sacrament based on these passages? So I have some starting questions for you to think about as we read through these five passages. Number one, what does God say it is? What's involved in this sacrament? We're going to talk about, does it describe the earthly elements that we were talking about in section number two? Does it actually say that God offers us forgiveness of sins? Is it something that God says, do this? Those are three important questions. What is it? What does it offer? Why should we do it? Why should we continue to practice this? Why should we be careful when we make use of it? The Bible doesn't tell us anything about being careful when it comes to baptism, but it does tell us to be careful when it comes to the Lord's Supper. How should one prepare to receive the Lord's Supper? How often should a person receive the Lord's Supper? Does the Bible answer that question? With whom? Should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? And then finally, is there anything else? Are there any other things that we can glean from these five passages that are important for us as we start to build a case for what the, the Lord's Supper is, what God tells us it is, and how it should be practiced in the church still today? So those are just some thought questions for you to keep in the back of your mind as we now break uh, these next five sections down and, and read each one individually. So the Catechism tells us that there are four places where we find the words of institution, the institution of the Lord's Supper. And that's in Matthew, Mark, Luke. John does not record the institution of the Lord's Supper, but the Apostle Paul does in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we're going to look at those four sections, and then we're also going to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul also deals with some very important parts about the Lord's Supper as well. So let's start with Matthew 26. If you have your Bibles, open up to Matthew 26. Matthew 26. 
We're going to start with that one. And we're going to look at the broader context of the institution, not just the institution itself, but a little bit more about the background, what's going on when Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. So we've got a few extra verses that we're going to be reading through. Matthew 26, beginning with verse 17, we get the background from Matthew himself. One thing to keep in mind, we all recognize that God inspires his word so, for example, Moses, even though he wasn't there at the creation of the world, was given the very words to describe the creation of the world by the Holy Spirit centuries later. So we don't believe that a person has to be an eyewitness of those things in order to record it faithfully. But it is interesting to note that Matthew was one of the twelve. He was in the room and heard these words of Jesus, and he records those things with, with an eyewitness account of what actually took place. So let's begin. Matthew 26, verse 17. Is there a volunteer to read our first section from Matthew? You know what happens if I don't give volunteers? Kayla? Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, Where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the, the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as he was eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he, he answered and said, he who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. But woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Then Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, and answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? And he said to him, You have said it. All right, let's stop there for just a minute. So this is the background for the institution of the Lord's Supper. What meal is it that Jesus and his disciples are eating on this evening? Passover. Okay, this is the Passover. And there were a number of pieces that were involved in the celebration of the Passover. Notice that the two disciples come to Jesus and say, hey, there's a lot of work that needs to be done for this meal. Where do you want us to go and prepare this? So this isn't just like the five minutes that we have when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. This is an entire feast. There was a whole lot of parts that went along with it. They actually had, they would read from Exodus chapters 13, 14, 15. They would include the Psalms. This is a whole liturgy, if we want to call it that, as they would celebrate and eat this meal along with reading a history of God's people in the Old Testament. And they had lamb. They had the roasted lamb. They had bitter herbs, which was told in the Old Testament. They had unleavened bread. This was connected to the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Remember in, in Exodus, God had said, I've done nine plagues. Pharaoh keeps changing his mind and letting, about letting you go. I'm going to have one more plague, and this time he is going to let you go. So you better be packed and ready to go. And he said, for a week leading up to this, you need to get all the leaven out of your home. So you'd, they, would, they would only had, have unleavened bread in their homes. And part of that was that unleavened bread lasts a lot longer than leavened bread. If you get a really good loaf of bread from uh, down at Schweiss, within two days it'll be moldy if you don't eat it quickly. Now you can get the stuff at, at Schutz that's got a lot of preservatives in it and it might like last two weeks or something like that. Well, they didn't have that ability back then, but unleavened bread will last a lot longer. So God was preparing them for the journey and being in the wilderness and all of that. So you've got the unleavened bread. They had unleavened bread that they would have and it would be uh, big sheets of it. That was part of the, the Passover celebration. They would dip it in the bitter herbs, which Jesus just mentioned here with Judas. It's the one who dips with me in, in the bowl. So all of these were part. And then part of it is they would have wine. Now, there's no specific mention in any of the Gospels of wine. But Jesus does speak about the fruit of the vine in a couple of the Gospel records. And we have to kind of keep in mind there's a big debate 
today as to whether or not you can use wine or can you use grape juice or can you substitute it with something else. But one of the things is that they didn't have grape juice in the days of Jesus. They didn't have refrigeration. So everything was, was wine. That's, they had different levels of, of alcohol content in wine, but that's all that they would have had and that was what was used in the Passover celebration. So we've got a little bit of background, the celebration of the Passover. Jesus points out, one of you is going to betray me. And so that was done uh, during this night, the night before he was crucified. Now let's pick it up with the actual words of institution. Kayla, go on. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this, this, of this, the fruit of the vine, from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's house, in my father's kingdom. And then they had, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. All right. So. Uh, the Passover celebration usually ended with the singing of uh, Psalm 114 or one of those uh, songs of ascent from the Old Testament. Uh, when they had finished that, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So there's the, there's the whole context of the celebration of the Lord's Supper in the midst of the, the eating of the Passover meal. So now let's go back to a couple of our questions. First of all, do we know what the earthly elements were that Jesus used to institute the Lord's Supper? Now, okay, bread, and it, the, the gospel actually only tells us the cup. But in that last section that Kayla read in verse 29, we do have the fruit of the vine. And for the, for the Jews, that would have been wine. Uh, grape juice, fermented, so grape wine would have been what was used. And we don't just have bread. Because in the celebration of the Passover, they wouldn't have used regular bread. They would have had to use unleavened bread. So we know those two things. It tells us that he broke uh, the bread and he passed the cup. And so we have the two earthly elements. So if we go back to our column here, number two, we, we have earthly elements that are described. Unleavened bread, the fruit of the vine, which would have been grape wine. Okay, what else can we learn from these verses? What are some other things that we can take away from these verses from Matthew chapter 26 that are important to help us understand the Lord's Supper or the practice of it? Yeah, she said it's a remission of sins. Okay, so that's pretty important. Matthew is one of the only Gospels that actually includes that phrase. So this is the why. Why do we take the Lord's Supper? Why do we receive it? Why did Jesus institute it? He says it is, we receive the forgiveness of sins. That is found in his, now his blood had not yet been shed. That would be the next day, the next morning. But he, he tells us that this is what's taking place. You're receiving forgiveness of sins or remission of sins. What else? Any others? There's another really important one that we don't want to lose sight of. Now, it's going to be repeated a couple of different times. But this is important when we start to talk about errors that have crept in in connection with the Lord's Supper. It says, take, eat, this is my body. Okay, so Jesus says, we're talking, with, we're talking about an earthly element. That earthly element is unleavened bread and it is wine. But he tells us that what we actually receive is what? His body and his blood. So we have those in verses 27 and 28. He says, this is, well, it's 26. This is my body. We talked a little bit about that last week in church with the, the Reformation movement. Ulrich Zwingli was one of the very first to deny the bodily presence of Jesus in the Lord's Supper. He said, I just can't understand it. He ascended into heaven. He can't be here present in the meal. And Luther kept going back to that Greek word is. This is my body. This is my blood. And so we might, from a human perspective, not understand that, but we can't deny what Jesus says. We, we can admit, I don't understand it, but we can't go so far as to say, it's not true. It's not true. 
Because once we start down that road and saying what God says is not true, then we've opened a whole Pandora's box of problems when it comes to the scriptures, haven't we? So Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. So this is what we call, what's that doctrine called? What do we call that? We're going to talk about the errors in connection with the Lord's Supper. Real the real presence of Christ's body and blood in the sacrament. So the real presence, and that's in contrast to representation. The body and the blood of Jesus are simply represented by the bread and the wine. Or in the Roman Catholic view, and we're going to talk more about this when we get into 1 Corinthians, the Roman Catholic view is that the bread and the wine are changed into the body and blood of Christ. The substance is completely changed. It doesn't remain bread and wine. It becomes the body and blood of Jesus. That's called transubstantiation, a change in the substance. So those are two, the two false teachings that we'll get into a little bit next week. Any other thoughts that you noticed? Anything else that you noticed about? This is, this is something that tests our faith, to believe what it says here without having to have it explain how and why it happens. Correct. And, you know, now some people would say, well, you Christians, you have a blind faith. You know, you'll, you'll trust everything blindly. And I will often tell them, God gives me so many reasons to believe the things that are hard for me to understand by showing me the things that are easy for me to understand. So you're right. The doctrine of the Lord's Supper is one of those difficult things, sort of like the doctrine of the Trinity or of uh, the, the, the doctrine of Jesus becoming human, the incarnation. Those are difficult things for us to understand. And yet look at all of the things that God reveals to us and has demonstrated time and time again. You can trust me because we can see that these things are true. He's got a track record that says... I'm, I'm somebody who's trustworthy. And so when we come to the Lord's Supper, we can say, I don't get it. I don't understand it. But God says it is so. And if God says it is so, I'm going to accept it by faith. So that's a good point. Anything else on Matthew 26? Verse 29. What about 29? Where he says, I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day. When I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. So this is an interesting one, and I, I didn't really want to get into this because it's separate from the Lord's Supper, but... Uh, Good job. What, <laughs> yeah, well done. I didn't pay her for that. <laughs> what do we learn from that? I don't know. Okay. So this is an interesting verse. So there's a couple of things that we can draw from, from this section as a whole and this verse as well. What's interesting is, first of all, what is the new in my Father's kingdom? What is he speaking about? Heaven. Okay, he's speaking about heaven. Now, so one of the errors that you often run into in connection with the Lord's Supper is the fact that there are a group of, of believers that say that we shouldn't use wine. We have to use grape juice because wine is dangerous. And, and it can be. There are many times where alcohol has been abused. But they will go so far sometimes as to say that Jesus didn't use wine. He used grape juice. We can, we can get into that because there are specific Greek words that he uses that were only used to describe wine. But what's interesting, you have the teetotalers, you know, it says you, know, you can't drink any alcohol whatsoever. And, and Jesus says, well, I'm going to be drinking this new in my father's kingdom. That's kind of an interesting thing. And it reminds us, kind of like Paul says with Timothy, you should have a little bit of wine for your stomach's sake, that wine is not a bad thing. Now, it can be abused, but it isn't a bad thing. Noah, when he got off of the ark, planted a vineyard. That wasn't a bad thing. He probably made it a little bit too strong, and that was why he became drunk in, in that chapter. But wine by itself isn't a bad thing. And I think one of the neat things about this verse is it points out that there will be wine in heaven. It just won't be abused wine. So that's kind of an interesting thing. Again, off the subject of the Lord's Supper specifically, you but say, it relates to it. You say uh, it's easily abused or can, can be abused. So can deserve. Sure. Any gift of God can be abused. Absolutely. And that is an important thing for us to realize that anything 
that God has given to be a blessing to us by human beings, sadly to say, we have taken and we have ruined or we have abused by too much. So you're very right. All right. Yes, Dave. Doesn't it kind of show closed communion too? Because Jesus didn't say, go out and get everybody in here. We're going to have communion. So, yeah, you're taking a look at the context, and that's really good, because you're right. He's only celebrating this with his closest disciples. And I think another thing that comes out with this, now we have to be a little bit careful when we get to the other Gospels. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more. But notice that he deals with the betrayal of Judas in Matthew prior to the institution of the Lord's Supper. Now, there is one of the other Gospels that flips it around and puts the Lord's Supper institution before dealing with Judas. But when we take a look at, again, all of the passages dealing with communion and we deal with the doctrine of the Lord's Supper and we talk about close communion and how Paul describes it in First and Second, uh, First Corinthians chapters 10 and 11, it makes sense that Jesus would have dealt with Judas first and that he would not have received the Lord's Supper. And so you're right. I think there is something that we can learn on the doctrine of closed communion. It's, it's more, it's not prescriptive. In other words, we're not being told what we should or shouldn't do as far as the practice of the Lord's Supper yet in this verse. But it does give us some context for when we get to those prescriptive verses, we say, well, that's exactly what Jesus did, or it seems like it from Matthew chapter 26. So that's a good point also. Any others? Oh, you're a great class. All right, let's, let's go to Mark. Flip to Mark chapter 14. This is a little bit of a longer section also. We're going to review some of the same background information in Mark's gospel, a little bit different perspective. Keep in mind that Mark may not have been an eyewitness of all of these events. Uh, there are those throughout history who believe that Mark is the only gospel to record. Do you, you remember the account after the disciples leave the upper room, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the soldiers come and they arrest Jesus and there's this account, this strange account of a, a young man who flees and one of the soldiers grabs his cloak and he flees away naked. Uh, many early church uh, fathers and historians believe that that individual was probably the young man Mark. And that most likely the upper room where Jesus sent Paul or Peter and John to, sell, uh, to prepare for the Lord's Supper was probably John Mark's mother, uh, Mary's house. And so if, if that were the case, and we can't nail that down for sure, but if that were the case, you can imagine some little boy intrigued by what's going on upstairs in, in the room, in the guest place, you know, sticking his head up in the window, you know, to check out what's going on. So he might have been a, an eyewitness of part of these events, though maybe not all of them as Matthew was. But yet we have the doctrine of inspiration that shows us this is God's word regardless of whether Mark actually saw all of these events or not. So we're going to pick it up with verse 12. Mark chapter 14, verse 12. Volunteer to read? Dave? On the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house, he enters, the teacher asks, where is, my get, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left and went into the city and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they pre prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were sad, and one by one they said to him, Surely not I. It is one of the twelve, he replied. One who dips bread into the bowl with me, the Son of Man will, will go just as it is written about him, but woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. 
it would be better for him to have not been born. Let's stop there for just a minute, Dave. So, again, similar context to what we have in Matthew. Uh, some of the details are just a little bit different. They, sometimes we're given some additional details that are not included in the other Gospels. Uh, once again, we have Jesus pointing out Judas as the betrayer prior to the institution of the Lord's Supper. So Matthew and Mark are the same in that regard. Luke is going to be the one who's going to flip those two things around. Anything that you've noticed so far? There's one thing that I wanted to kind of key on based on what Dave had said in Matthew's Gospel that I think is, is helpful. And I don't know if anybody caught it. The word disciple is a very, very broad term. It's kind of like the word sacrament. You can have a lot of different things that fit into that category. So the disciples could mean all of those individuals that were sitting down at the feet of Jesus. That could be the, the 10,000 people on the side of the, the Sea of Galilee that were all sitting there listening to Jesus. But it can also be used in a, small, in a more narrow way. And, and in this case, we're actually told what the word disciples refers to. It refers to the two guys to begin with that go to prepare the feast. So there it means two. But did you catch in verse 17? The 12. So now we're back to that inner group that Jesus is saying, I'm gathering together with the 12. So going back to Dave's point about close communion, Jesus could have instituted the Lord's Supper on the seashores of the Sea of Galilee, celebrated the Passover with a huge group. He doesn't do that, does he? He takes the time out to go up and away and into a room, and he does this. He could have celebrated the Passover with a large group, but he doesn't. He does it specifically with this group that he'd spent three years training. And so you get to the, the doctrine of closed communion, and you think about the importance of, of working with these individuals and preparing them for what, as far as we know, Jesus did not institute the Lord's Supper in year one of his ministry or year two of his ministry. It was year three of his ministry, right before his death and resurrection, that he instituted the Lord's Supper after he had had time to prepare his disciples for celebrating this supper. So I think that's kind of an important point too. Again, if we think about it from that perspective, understanding this is a small group, it's not a broad group that Jesus celebrates the Lord's Supper with. Now he is going to tell us later on, I want you to continue to do this with other people in, in generations to come. But to begin with, he does it with this small, narrow group of the 12. Any other thoughts on 12 to 21? Yes? Well, so, the, yeah, you have to kind of get Luke and John's gospel to see what the dialogue is with, with Judas. But he does point him out. I don't know that we would say that he stays there because John is the one, and Luke does also, that talks a little bit more about Jesus saying, you, you better leave and do what you're supposed to do. So that came up in connection with this conversation. It's just that Matthew and Mark don't record that part of the conversation. So we'll kind of come back to that a little bit later on. Uh, so let's pick it up. Uh, 22, David. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them. And they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. When he had sung, when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Again, same final verse that Matthew includes in his gospel. Uh, we have the same thing that we read in the gospel of Matthew. Take, eat, this is my body. Take and, well, he doesn't say take and drink in Mark's gospel, but he says he, he gave the cup to them and said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. And then that same final verse, uh, I won't drink this again until I come uh, into the kingdom of God. So a lot of, a lot of parallels between Matthew and Mark. The one key difference is that Matthew does include, as I think Kayla mentioned, uh, that phrase, the remission of sins, which Mark leaves out the reason for the sacrament as a whole. But we have the real presence taught once again. Uh, Jesus tells us we've got these earthly elements of unleavened bread and wine, but it is also through the word of God 
his very body and his very blood. So any thoughts or questions or uh, additional things to bring out in Mark's gospel that you noticed? Yes, he calls it, this is, um, this is my blood of the new covenant. Okay. So think about what's going on here. They're celebrating the Passover, which goes all the way back to Egypt and the Exodus. And the writer to the Hebrews is going to get into that a little bit more in depth where he talks about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. So he's pointing out to the disciples, this is something that's new. And through my death, I'm instituting a, a new covenant with people. So the first covenant was at Mount Sinai, which God's people broke. God, that was a one-sided covenant where God said, you know, this is, I'm going to do all of this. Well, the, the children of Israel, they broke that over and over and over again throughout their history. The new covenant, the writer of the Hebrews tells us, is a one-sided covenant. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on human beings and the, and the law. It depends entirely on Christ's work of forgiveness. So he pours out his blood, the blood of the animals, which was pictured, you know, those those sacrifices didn't do anything for human beings. They simply pointed ahead to that ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would bring out. So does yours actually have new covenant in it? Okay. So mine just has the blood of the covenant. The word new is not included in there, but any... Is this where, like, that we can stop sacrificing animals? Well... Those practices kind of go away? Yeah, I think it's implied here. The, the writer to the Hebrews is, the and Paul, too, in, in 1 Corinthians, is going to deal with that particular topic where he says, uh, in Colossians, for example, Jesus is the, sh is the f fulfillment, the shadow, all these things of the Old Testament, but Jesus is the fulfillment, so we don't need to be tied by the, those Old Testament regulations. So Hebrews and Colossians and 1 Corinthians, all of those kind of help to build that picture of the fact that that's all at an end now. This is something that is new. Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts? Yes. In verse one, it also includes when they killed the Passover lamb. All the way back to verse one. Uh, so the first, first verse, we're in verse twelve. Oh, verse twelve. Okay. That wasn't in Matthew. Oh, there. Okay, I see. Yep, absolutely. And, and that goes back to, if you're reading through Exodus, you know some of the practice, but you're right, that gives us a little bit more of the detail. It actually mentions the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we had talked about in Matthew, and the killing of the Passover lamb. That is a whole interesting conversation by, by itself, the symbolism of the killing of that lamb. Because when God instituted the Passover in Exodus, He told the children of Israel, you have to have a male lamb, that lamb has to be one year old, and it has to be spotless. No broken bones, no blemishes. So there were three qualifications for that, un, uh, that, 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 that lamb that was going to be a substitute. And when you think about that, you have Jesus, who's a male. You have Jesus, who is in the prime of his, of his youth, you know, 30 years of age, 33. And, and then you have him being holy. He is completely without spot. And so there's, there was some beautiful symbolism in some of the sacrifices like Kayla was talking about. And as Nathan points to the fact that yeah, this, is all, this is all culminating in what was going to take place on the next day. Because Jesus was going to be that spotless young male lamb whose blood was going to be shed for the sins of the world. All of those sacrifices pointed to what was going to take place just a few hours from this very event. Anything else? All right. Oh, I'm going to have to change my schedule. Uh, so Luke would be the next one. Uh, now that you have the references, we're going to have to uh, stop here. I think what we'll do is we'll read through the Gospel of Luke, uh, and then I'll give you a chance to think about it a little bit over the next week. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Uh, this begins with verse 7. Again, similar context since it's the same as what we've had in Matthew and Mark. Uh, this will be familiar, but we'll kind of look for some specific details that might be different. A volunteer to read Luke 22. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, 
When you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room where there make ready. So they went and found just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, among yourselves. For I say to you, 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 I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Let's stop there for just a minute, Kayla, sorry. Uh, this was what we had last week in our gospel reading. It was mislabeled. I think it had Matthew on it, but it was, it was from Luke's account. And it can be a little bit confusing because at first the language sounds like it's describing the Lord's Supper in verse 17, but it's not. And in the Passover, they would actually have the cup that would make four cycles around the table. It was called the four cups of the Passover. And so what Luke is describing is one of the previous cups that would get passed around, but it wasn't the one that Jesus used for the institution of the Lord's Supper yet. That's going to come later on. So Luke gives us a little bit more detail as far as the Passover as a whole, showing us this broader picture of what was going on. Luke also tells us that it was Peter and John in verse 8 that were the two disciples that went to prepare it. And I've always thought it was interesting how Jesus does this. If this was Mary's house, all Jesus had to do with Peter and John is say, go to Mary's house and talk to Mary and, and she'll point you to the upper room. But he doesn't do that. He says, go into town. You're going to see a guy with a jar on his head. Follow him. Figure out which house he goes into. And then go in and talk to the owner of that house. And it's almost like he's, again, point, back to Emily's point. It's one of those examples where Jesus is giving us evidence for the fact that we can trust him by, by giving this you know, sort of complicated system instead of just making it as simple as possible. It's kind of like the, on Palm Sunday with the, the two cults, the cult and, and the mother, you know, and how Jesus tells them to do that too. Often Jesus would do that in order for them to realize Jesus knows what he's talking about. He's omniscient. He knows everything and, and we can trust him. So we'll pick it up there. Uh, if you want to finish reading the section that deals with the Lord's Supper, this gets into a little bit more of the topic with Judas, uh, but we'll come back to that. We'll take a look at that for next week. If you want to take a look at 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 in preparation for next week. I'd encourage you to do that too because those are a little bit deeper and we're going to get into some new things that are not found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in those two sections from 1 Corinthians. So any thoughts before we, before we close this morning? Let's bow our heads then and we'll close with the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.